Hello, everybody. My name is Music Man, and today I have a treat for you because this weekend, me and uh, Black Phoenix, another IDV content creator in the community, uh, got together and we talked for around an hour and a half over all of the balance changes that are being implemented in the test server. So this video will be structured into many different sections. I'll have those labeled in the description as usual. And we're gonna be hitting all of the topics that are gonna be going through to the test server. And let's get into the video. So, hello. Hello. Uh, okay, so I'm Black Phoenix. Most people know me as Phoenix now in the community. Uh, I am a Identity5 content creator, streamer, originally started as being a streamer and then just went into the YouTube kind of stuff. And I also do other kind of asymmetrical games. I'm kind of also playing stuff like Dead by Daylight, although I'm quite new to it. And I've also kind of branched into like Prop Night that's also in the same kind of 1v4 genre. And I am, I wouldn't say I'm a top player. I'm just someone who's been playing the game and analyzing it for quite a long time. I have been uh well, i'm mostly a hunter main i'm not really much of a survivor but you know i have uh, a lot of people on the server that teach me a lot about their perspectives on things it's a good thing and i would say i've been uh, i used to be a b badge lucino i've been a c badge violinist and a c badge undead for quite a while so that's good but i don't really rank that often because of game issues that are happening right now <laughs> but yeah how about you my name is Music Man. I am also an IDV content creator. I am currently a top 200 hunter in the server right now. Uh, some of my former badges have been top 10 for Bloody Queen. I am currently a top 10 Mad Eyes, and I also have been first Anne, right when she was like rising in the meta there. Uh, yeah. I started off uh, making my own content around March of 2020, and then I gradually moved into starting to stream some of my rank sessions there. I remember, I remember kind of watching some of your kind of analysis kind of stuff. Uh, I remember, I think I first originally found you because you were covering kind of high tier spawn stuff. I re I vaguely remember I, I, and stuff like that, but. Uh, very, very, very useful information. I was always interested in the competitive side of stuff, right? So, because I never really invested a lot of time into rank because I didn't have the time, <laughs> you know? Uh, and also, you know, just making videos and stuff like that took up more time when I was writing scripts and stuff. So it's cool to get other people's perspectives, but I like to analyze it. So it's good to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I've definitely learned a lot through analyzing both China gameplay in addition to commentating for the ICL and stuff. It certainly was a very instructive experience. Yeah. What did you learn from that? Uh, I learned a lot more about like how the meta works and how it's very dynamic and dependent on a lot of like the balance things that goes on in the game. It's been very interesting mm -hmm. to see how the meta has sort of evolved over time. I started playing in around Season 9, and the game has certainly changed a lot since then, especially with the introduction of characters like Breaking Wheel, the introduction of Geisha yeah. in the meta, a lot of um, interesting dynamics with how increasingly important the late game has become versus the early game. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also really interesting to see how survivors rotate early game in addition to seeing how hunters put the pressure on late game. Yeah, I would say that the um, the meta has changed quite drastically, at least from what I can tell. Yeah, um, over the last couple of uh, well, with the last maybe three or four releases of characters. Yes. Yeah. Um, sure. Especially with things when psychologist and patient came out, they instantly kind of entered into the uh, to the meta. So that was interesting to see because that's not something that happens that often. I would say that kind of characters usually take a while to kind of get into to the meta. People work them out, but you know, uh, they were kind of like a, they were pretty strong on release. A little girl, I don't think, is little girl currently able to be played in Koa? People keep on saying yes and no, but. That's kind of a debatable one at the moment. You're kind of leaning more towards the, uh, the patients, the psychologists, ones that are either very, very strong and like, what I kind of see is like, if you're a strong decoder, rescuer, support, or kiter, a lot of times you're, yeah being used, but a lot of times Little Girl kind of prides herself as sort of like an assist, but you also have characters like Priestess in the game that, uh, Priestess and Seer, which are both very, very good assist characters, or you have characters yeah. like Acrobat and Patient in the meta, 
Um, some very, very good kiting characters. Little Girl is kind of like a balance, but it's just a matter of would that type of scenario work in competitive gameplay? And I don't believe we've yeah. seen her very often yet, but I'm definitely interested to see how uh, she plays out in the future. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of uh, people that consider her to be strong, but at the same time, you know, there are a lot of players who don't play her well yet, and they do, you know, waste use her abilities kind of at the wrong time, interrupting uh, attack animations and stuns and stuff like that, yeah? So I guess it, it's better, I think she would do better in a voice comm team, because you'd be able to communicate with your team, you know, when to, uh, when to use your abilities and when to, they should use theirs. But uh, yeah, maybe it's just the fact that you know, if two people are not decoding, then it's a bit of a bit of a problem. Yeah, for <laughs> that might just be the issue. Yeah. So uh, I guess we've got a lot of changes that are coming up right now uh, with IDV. A lot of things are in the in the test server. Uh, yes. So I have a post here. Uh, credit to Invisible Jong One for providing this post on Reddit. And there's just a whole list of balance changes, and we're going to roll through all of them for you today and kind of give our insight as to how this might change the dynamic of how the game works. Yes. Well, I definitely think this is going to change up how the, the game works as a whole. I, I think that it's going to be... I think it might affect some of the hunters, which ones are on the top and which ones are kind of at the bottom. But I do think that there might be some issues for some of the older hunters, but that might just be my opinion on that. So that's, uh, what would you like to talk about first? Would you like to talk about the decoding? Or would you like to talk about kind of some of the other kind of persona web changes? And I guess also the changes to some of the survivors. I think I would like to start with kind of the new map spawn system because that's been oh. a great area of interest for me as I, yeah. I spent a lot of time last year creating uh, spawn guides and everything for my channel. Yeah. I spent a lot I remember rising this as a very <laughs> old gamer myself. <laughs> so yeah. let's just read what it has, uh, what, what the post says regarding that. So Go for it. Addition to map area spawn picks. In each game, there is now a phase where survivors and hunters can choose which area of the map they spawn at. Each map is separated to 9 to 12 areas, whereas the survivor and hunter can each select an area to spawn in the map, and the survivor would spawn at a random place in a designated area. The distance between survivor and hunter when spawn won't be massive. There are three phases of map area spawn pick, survivor selection phase, Hunter selection phase and confirmation phase. After survivor selects all characters, it enters a survivor selection phase. In this phase, survivors can see each other's selected area and can swap areas. In this phase, the hunter cannot see what areas the survivor chose. After the survivor chooses or the timer ends, the survivor selection phase ends. After the hunter selects their character in survivor selection phase ends, it enters hunter spawn area selection phase. In thus phase, the hunter can see the areas the survivor chose, but they cannot see which survivor picks which area. After the hunter selected their spawn area or timer runs up, it enters the confirmation phase. After the hunter selection phase ends, both factions enter confirmation phase. In this phase, the hunter can see all survivor names, characters, and selected areas. The survivors can only see hunter's spawn area after the timer ends, the game, the game starts. In this mode, survivor max character selection time is 40 seconds, hunter is 70 seconds. This mode is only at legendary rank and customs. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of information there that we got to break down for sure. It was yeah, that's a big game. change. I think what really helped was the ID5 community Fun. channel actually released a Fun video. Community, yeah, yeah they, they released a video showing what this looked like. And yep. If this ends up being implemented in rank, um, it's going to be, I believe, problematic. Uh, and like kind okay. of, especially if this is implemented at a competitive level. And there are a few reasons, mm -hmm. right? And we're going to break those down for you. So basically, what this means is that survivors are able to pick where in the map they want to spawn. And each character gets to pick where in the map they spawn. So. Like for instance, say you have a, but they cannot 
they can't choose to spawn together in the same block, for example. Yes, each each survivor gets their own block they're able to spawn in. Yes, that's very important to know. So let's say for a hypothetical scenario, we're gonna say we have a mechanic, an acrobat, a Ford, and a mercenary on Sacred Heart Hospital. So in this hypothetical scenario, as a hunter, early game, you're going to want to find either the mechanic or the acrobat, correct? Because yep. obviously mercenary forward, not very great chases. So <laughs> They would waste a lot of time in the early game. That's <laughs> Yes. <for sure. laughs> so where I think this becomes problematic, especially on maps like Sacred Heart Hospital or Leo's Memory, um, which has both the hospital or the factory, the, the decoder can actually choose to spawn in those areas that are just unchaseable. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to... Yeah, that is a big issue. Yeah. That is, you make a good point there. Um, as soon as they get to choose either, yeah, either the kind of the main hospital, it is a great place to be. But the problem with that as well is that the hunter is going to know that they spawn there. Oh, well, maybe not know. It's a, it's a mind game. You've got to be like, okay, I'm going to place someone there is it going to be the decoder? Oh, well, now you wasted your time going into the, the hospital to find out there's no one there. Well, the interesting about this is that the hunter gets to actually see who is where by the end of the phase. Yeah. So the hunter will actually know whether the decoder is at hospital, which I guess... You, you don't know who it is, I think. You only get to see that there is someone in there. As far as I could tell, at least from the video, you could see like that. You could see the layout of where everyone has spawned, but you couldn't see which specific survivor was in each location. As far as I understood from the, the video, at least that I watched. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but I don't know. I'd have to watch that again. But if that's the way it works, that could be potentially very problematic. Um, so yeah. you could say you have the mechanic spawn uh, hospital. You could have like the acrobat spawn ruins. And then it doesn't really matter what yep. the forward or merc are going to spawn because that's not going to be your first chase. I mean, as a hunter. Yep. Definitely not ideal unless you're like a breaking wheel or another character with an extremely strong chase that can actually go after those characters. It's definitely not yep. ideal. Yeah, I feel like it's going to heavily affect the early game that I do understand. Because we've got to take all of these changes, in my opinion, all the ones that we're going to talk about next, uh, into as one big hole. There's definitely some kind of idea or change that NetEase is just trying to impl implement to the game. And I do think that they're trying to change up the early game. Maybe they are worried that the changes that are coming to uh, decoding is going to affect early game in rank. And so that's where they're trying to slow down the early game by making it easier for survivors to pick and choose where they are. I think it makes sense in kind of from their perspective because it makes rank into more of a competitive mode because you have more control over where your team spawns. And it, like, it makes sense, but in, as you said, like, it doesn't feel balanced when, yeah, you can choose from mechanic that is a pretty, a very good decoder, but has the usual weakness of if they spawn in a bad place, their doll's gonna be found uh, pretty early, they're gonna be found and then they're gonna be out and they don't do anything. But if they can spawn, as you said, in hospital, this uh, means that they can, you know, you can pretty confidently choose mechanic and not have any issues. Yeah, so I think one thing's for sure, if this is something that's implemented just the way as it stands, I think it's going to make rank at least a lot less RNG-based. Because we've all had those frustrating moments where we end up starting a chase, we find like the mercenary first, and then as a hunter, it kind of screws up, so screws up the whole match. Uh, but we've also had those moments, if we played Survivor, where... Like, say you're a mind's eye and you spawn, like, right in forest and hospital. Like, you're going to be in a really tough position there. So I think yep. it's definitely going to make uh, the results of the game a lot less luck-based. So that's true. That will, be, that will be a perk. I'm just not so sure personally if this is the right way to go about it. It's going to be chaotic, I think, for the first few... Well, more than a few weeks as everyone works this out, if it gets implemented at all, because I think that, well, I don't really know what China and Chinese players and competitive, like, you know, people that play in tournaments think about this, because I'm assuming this will also be added to tournament gameplay. Yes. yes. Uh, we, we would assume. Yeah. Um, so they've got to 
completely forgets spawn point information. That's not <laughs> important anymore, as you said, yeah? Um, and it's going to be a mind game. It's going to be like, oh, well, it, you know, depending on how it's implemented, if you can't, you know, you can see where the survivors are, but you don't know which ones they are, it's going to be like, okay, I'm going to put so I'm going to put a survivor in hospital. Your the hunter's going to think it's going to be mechanic, but it's not. Mechanic is somewhere else, and that's going to waste time. Or you know, it's going to be a bit of a weird back and forth. But it does feel a little bit unbalanced on some maps more than others. I think. Yeah. So I think this will definitely add a little sense of like a mind game even before the match begins. But. Also, I think this will eliminate kind of the scenarios where, for instance, there was an old spawn, I believe it was spawn group four on church, uh, the old spawn group four that was removed from the game. And there, the reason because of it was because there would be a survivor that always spawns top broken. And if that was the decoder and yeah. competitive gameplay, that was almost a guaranteed loss for the survivors, especially if they were going yeah. against a very good chase hunter, there was just nothing that the hunter was going to be able to, nothing that the survivors were going to be able to do in that scenario. But it's also going to remove spawns like, you know, one of my least favorite spawns is spawn group five on hospital, the one where you kind of spawn in kind of like the, that corner back gate area. Um, and yep. every survivor spawns either in ruins or at hospital. And I find that to be personally a problematic Not spawn. Fun. But <laughs> with the introduction of this system, at least scenarios like that, where even where you spawn can sometimes impact greatly the early game, I think mm -hmm. it'll just it'll just be definitely interesting to keep track of in the future. Yeah. Do you think this kind of leads us to talk about like how hunters, like specific hunters, are going to be affected by this? Because I think this is a big change for this is going to change the meta to be. Maybe a bit more, do you think that hunters that have informational abilities where they can learn information, for example, the recent addition would be Clerk, right? I know she's not meta right now because she's not being added to, she's not uh, being added to rank mode or anything like that, but she has this ability to be able to check cipher machines. Do you think hunters that have that ability to, you know, quickly locate survivors, is that going to just be useless now? Well, is I almost think this could be extra information for hunters like Wuchang, because by looking at the, the video footage for it, it looks like the survivors will actually spawn in like the exact area, like in their little box, like kind of in the exact mirror. It, it looks like oh, it would be okay. guaranteed to spawn yeah. in a specific place. And in the case, if the hunters are able to actually see what character it is and stuff, hunters that are able to get to that area quickly, I believe could benefit mm -hmm. from that. Um, without mm -hmm. feeling like they're having to risk their early abilities. Okay. Yeah, that, that's a good point. So, yeah, but the problem is that hunters that are slower and... Well, I guess this is also a thing where you have to choose your own position correctly, right? Yeah. And this is, I think, another reason why they've added this new Persona web ability uh, called... What's it called? The one that blocks the further cipher machine. In general... Uh, this, I think this might have been implemented as a way of adding another layer to this, uh, map spawning. Because if you can know that you're going to spawn here, you can now assume that that cipher machine over there is going to be blocked. Yes? Yeah. So this is kind of in relation to, for all the viewers out there, this is, uh, in relation to the hunter persona owl replaced by mm -hmm. confinement. And it says at the start of the game. The cipher nearest to the hunter will be banned for from decoding for 40 seconds. So this could lead to some certain scenarios where if the hunter spawns near the decoder and the decoder, say, wants to spawn at like that hospital cipher, for instance, but the hunter is like right there, that decoder is not going to be able to decode right away, which could potentially uh, lead to some mind gaming, especially at like the competitive level. Yeah, it, especially if, well, because this is something that is very cheap to buy point wise. Yes, with your Persona web, it's replacing Owl that was only one point you had to invest into that. Yeah. Um, so, and if you're taking Trump card, for example, that is a very popular pick. And who knows if it will be, because uh, I think this is going to, all these changes are going to definitely change up the Persona web um, a lot. I think. I think they will. Survive with Persona webs at least. Yeah. Investing one point into something that is not very impactful. In, I'm not sure, like in the current state of the game, blocking the further cipher machine from you, and only one cipher machine, 
feels like it, it's sometimes impactful, but again, it was very RNG. Yes. Yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, you know spawn points better than I do, but uh, yeah, you know all the names and the numbers and stuff like that. But I, you know, I I know them from like just playing matches and more or less assuming where they are, right? Um, sometimes, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. One thing that's important about this is that in kind of the spawn point, if you just take you pull out your spawn points in front of you, just click through all the maps, like right in succession, you'll yeah. see that no survivor actually ever spawns next to like the furthest cipher from the hunter. Um, exactly. The way you kind of see it is you have like the hunter kind of in the middle and then survivors kind of spawn around them. So yeah. Or they fan out in front of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So with the current state of the game and especially in stuff like quick match that are not receiving, uh, you know this change at all but this because it's only for legendary right with the with the spawn points it's only legendary and custom so anyone playing in like quick match is going to find this ability like nice to have but not very useful yeah. yes um there's a similar ability i know i don't really want to talk about other games but there's a similar ability in uh, dead by daylight this is where the, i think the inspiration came from and if i'm correct on the effects of this obviously it's a different game slower pace match and stuff like that but uh, it usually blocks i think the furthest two or three cypher machines um and i don't think it's considered to be overpowered but that's because it's a different game but you can see that even in our game blocking one cypher machine for only 40 seconds that it takes on average i want to say five seconds to get to a to walk to a yeah. cypher machine from a spawn point it's not really that much anyway, even if it if it, even if it was your cipher machine that you were spawned right next to, what do you think? Yeah, I I kind of agree with that statement. I think it will be it'll have very limited use, I suppose, um, just because that's kind of not exactly where the survivors spawn. But even if they do run into that <laughs> cipher, it's not necessarily going to take a super long time to transition to a new cipher that's able to be decoded. Yeah. Uh, and it's, again, it's, as you said, it's if they even spawn next to it, yes? Yeah. So, because uh, if they don't, then you, I guess you already had the points anyway, because you may have taken the, because you need to to get that anyway when you're unlocking things like Wanted Order, Trump Card, uh, what else? Well, those are probably the most important ones that you kind of head towards on that side of the Persona web. Yeah. If you have it, it's, it's nice, but if you want to just... If you wanted a Persona thing that was very impactful, I don't think that's really what it is. But it's better than Owl, because Owl, yeah. <laughs> as, far, as far as I remember, doesn't do anything, really. Yeah. So yes? The only way I can see this um, become possibly impactful, if it's used in conjunction with the new spawning system, if the survivor chooses to spawn at the opposite side of the map. Uh, yeah, but and you could choose that. You could put yourself far away from someone so that you know that their cipher machine has a higher chance of being blocked. Yeah, yes. and it'll just kind of force survivors a little more inward. Maybe that's kind of what they're going for. Quick question for you, because you have studied, um, you know, spawns and stuff like that. I'm not exactly sure, because I know that you have group one, group two, right? And you also have group one, group two for cipher machines too. Are they on, do they follow the same sequence? Is it like, if you're survivor group one, then you'll get group one cipher machine spawn, or can they, are they random? Just like dungeon spawns, uh, the, the cipher spawns are not dependent on the survivor spawns. So just because you get like, say, spawn group one with the survivor spawn does not necessarily mean you're going to get spawn group one with the cipher machines. I mean, yeah. depending on the map, I haven't studied so much the, the cipher spawn layouts because a lot of times I find that the survivor spawns are kind of significantly more impactful, but there are some yeah. scenarios, for instance, I believe it's spawn group two on Lakeside is the one that's big boat, and sometimes it can lead to survivors rotating away if uh, if Shore Cypher doesn't spawn, because a lot of times that hunter just kind of yep. beelines in that direction. So that can kind of sometimes impact whether a survivor without with limited communication is going to rotate into the hunter or away. Um, yep. Just a couple things like that. That makes it even more RNG as to if this is actually going to be effective because you could you could try and do the maths on like okay and how if all of them followed the sequence of group one group one group two group two yes um, you'd be like okay in 
the majority of spawns on this map, I will get some benefit from this, but you, you don't know because you don't know how far away the cypher missions are going to spawn because uh, it's just not, yeah. you know, not useful. <laughs> okay. Um, there are some other hunter persona traits that are going to be changed. Well, oh, there's another one. There's an additional one. Yeah. Hunter persona possessive replaced by endurance reduce 16, yeah. 24, 32% knockback effect and 12, 18, 24% deceleration effect. So this is replacing possession that was three persona points to the to the left, I believe. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> <Or> then, <laughs> Yeah, I think <laughs> it's the There's like yeah. specific traits, and I don't pay attention to what's in between sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so possession was the one that uh, in slowed decoding by I think it was three, six, and nine percent if the survivor was in your terror radius. Oh yeah. yeah. So that is kind of useful, but not something you want to aim towards unless again you're going for that side of the persona web, right? Yeah. For um, insolence is on the left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is now being it now. So this ability now reduces your knockback and also your slow. I believe it is um, slowing effects. I believe that's what that's talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So this is re uh, affecting characters like well, your resilience to characters like Wildling, Batter, Little Girl, and that's all I can think of. <laughs> Meta characters. Yeah, maybe the deceleration effect, maybe that has to do with something about like Acrobat's Mud Bomb as well. Like you might get slowed less because of that. Or Postman's uh, Dog, because he's currently semi meta. Like he's, yeah, he's meta. I would yeah. say he's meta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do you think this would be impactful? It's only 24%, at least for the sl uh, reducing the slow. Do you think that's impactful enough to invest points into it, even if you're not going into insolence? I think a lot of times what you're looking for when you're building a persona web is a lot of times you're looking for kind of those big traits at the end. And you kind of end up yeah. stuck in this situation where you're kind of stuck with all these other points along the way. And I'm finding <laughs> yeah. that a lot of these kind of passive abilities, unless you're going specifically into hunt, which I sometimes use with Mad Eyes for my early game chase, a lot of times, yep. uh, it's kind of tough to see at least the immediate effects of a lot of the passive abilities, at least that are on the Persona web. Yeah. This is a, maybe an addition that was definitely or needed to be added, I think, at some point anyway, because the number of survivors that now can harass has increased a lot since the Persona web was originally created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so stuff like rage that exists for slowing down your stun, for example, yes. is uh, impactful. Um, I see a lot of people take that, but so this one is less, well, you know, as more survivors come out and we will probably see more survivors come out soon that have some type of pushback ability instead of stuns, because I think Netties is also aware that they shouldn't just continuously release more and more stun survivors. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sure. that's why we've had things like batter. We've had little girl that don't technically stun you, but do leave you a small period of time without being able to do any actions. I believe the game still quantifies it as a stun though, because it still does things like cancels hunt ability, which kind of exclusively ends uh, when you vault, attack, or um, break a pallet, or you're stunned, and hunt does cancel out when you're stunned. So I believe the game itself, uh, just kind of the code does quantify it as a stun. But As far as I know, it well, I've heard the opposite, but uh, that could just be, I'm not, not saying you're wrong. I just, I've heard, the, I, you know, uh, from people like uh, Hellember players. Hellember does not get any rage from um, being pushed back by anything. Uh, and that uh, he only gets rage when he gets stunned. Yes. Yeah? So uh, it's like a small in between. Maybe that does affect stuff like Hunt, but it doesn't affect like flat out stun uh, things that say, you know, this is reduced by stun yeah. or something like that. Yeah. So it's, I don't think rage affected it though. I'm not really sure, but I'd have to check the yeah. trade again. It also might be some sort, some sort of form of being classified as like a controlling effect. I'm not sure. Yes, it probably is. That would probably be right. Yeah. But that's an interesting one. I think it's interesting that, uh, they're adding it and it's about time that they did, but is it something that you would want to invest your points in? Perhaps. Not really. I mean, not specifically, but if you're kind of going for insolence, yeah. it'll be 
probably more impactful than what was kind of there before. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else would you like to talk about? What would you like to talk about next? Uh, let me look down the list here. Oh, we should probably talk about the decoding as well. There are some significant decoding changes that I'm sure everybody here watching is very, very well aware of. <laughs> I'm panicking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as a Mad Eyes main, I'm slightly salty about this, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it off to you. So it says here, currently the initial decoding speed for Survivor is 1.24% a second. After 210 seconds, the decoding speed is increased to 1.61% a second. The adjusted decoding speed is initial decoding speed 1.14% a second. After 100 seconds, 1.25% a second. After 210 seconds, 1.59% per second. And after 280 seconds, 1.82% per second. So, yeah. Decoding limitations. When there are two survivors decoding, the time to decode a cipher is capped at 45 seconds shortest, while the time to decode a single cipher at any circumstance is capped at 40 seconds. And then it goes on to uh, list off some changes to calibrations, which are kind of relatively minimal in my opinion. But oh, I would say I would say the complete opposite actually but um that's i didn't realize it at first but the calibrations if there's uh, especially if you've watched identity 5 fan communities video yeah um they showed off the calibration effects and they do increase the cipher machine progress quite often but that's again something that you can't really quantify because you don't know exactly how many calibrations you're going to get per cipher machine you get but i would say it's probably in the range of you know two to four per cipher machine yeah, yeah. Uh, that can that will increase if you get them. I'm not sure if it's a perfect calibration, or I'm not sure if it's just a. I don't know about that. I'm not sure if it was just a perfect calibration or just a calibration in general. But you get two percent for the don't first increase uh, decoding. So it just kind of keeps the decoding moving forward without the calibration. Um, perfect ones are the ones that give the boost on the decoding. Yeah, but I'm I'm not completely sure if the. Uh, from because I don't have the exact uh, thing in front of me, but I'm pretty sure that uh, some people have said that it's only they've changed it now. So it's if you complete a calibration, it's going to be two percent. But even either way, if you do a perfect calibration, it's now two percent for each calibration until you complete three or four, and then it goes down to one percent extra every single time. That is actually a big change <laughs> because that does shorten decoding time even more, especially when we're talking about the final stage of accelerated decoding that's going to make it from you know decode even faster do you yes? know currently where it where uh, a calibration stands right now because i thought the numbers weren't changed significantly from where they currently stand but i could be incorrect i'm not completely sure what it is but i could tell from the videos the calibration jumped up much more than i'm used to seeing with normal perfect calibrations but I guess again i don't know what the exact <laughs> one is now yeah so it's interesting. So um, yeah, now Cypher machines have gone from, you know, for a default character um, with no buffs, no debuffs in decoding, it used to be, and it currently is, 81 seconds to finish the Cypher machine before accelerated decoding starts. Um, now it's been changed to 88 seconds. So that's seven seconds longer before the first stage pops up. But the first stage of accelerated decoding happens after 100 seconds, that is, give or take the time it takes you to finish one cipher machine, realistically, because you get to the first cipher machine, five seconds, um, you complete it, and then you com yeah, then you go to the next one. So by the time you get to a second cipher machine, the first stage of accelerated decoding probably has started. Yes? Yeah. If, with some general ideas. A lot of times that's like also that. probably about the amount of time it takes a hunter to be able to gather their first down and like the majority of like competitive matches that's about what happens. Yeah. So it is slowing down the early game. Yes. So I believe the slowing down of the early game is definitely going to improve kind of chase hunters. Uh, so characters like mm -hmm. Anne, your Geisha, your Bloody Queen your Soul Weaver even, characters that rely on like basically exclusively having a really good early game chase. I think this is going to significantly 
affect uh, those hunters in the um, when we're talking about kind of like early game viability. Yeah, the 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 earlier you can put your first person on the on the chair and the you know and get to another cipher machine to um, you know harass it a little bit, the better for the you know so hunters that can do that quickly, it's good for them. But for hunters like as you said, Mad Eyes or Dream Witch, I think, um, or even Photographer, that I think Photographer is going to suffer a lot. Those are the this. three. They um, suffer a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I want to also include Percy in that actually as well, but um, that's from my experience as an undead player. Okay. Um, yeah, it feels like yeah, any hunter that really wants to drag the game on um, will instantly suffer because cipher machines are in the last stage of accelerated decoding. You'll be able to finish a cipher machine if you have no buffs, no debuffs, in 55 seconds. So less than a minute. Yeah. Plus calibrations. Yes. Yes, correct. So, so that is crazy. Yeah, especially when you look at characters. Even breaking wheel might be potentially hurt by the end game effects of this, because a lot of times he kind of relies on like putting down his peepers and kind of dragging out the last cipher. Sometimes even on his own. Yes. Um. So I believe that might also hurt breaking wheel. So I believe this is kind of in a way to. Um, NetEase is trying to promote certain other like chasing hunters, but this also feels, at yeah. least as a hunter made myself, this feels like an indirect nerf to Mad Eyes, Dream Witch, Photographer, Breaking Wheel. Characters that kind of rely on end game pressure a lot of the times, I believe, will be um, punished significantly if these adjustments uh, go through on the global servers. That is possibly just a way of them changing up what's considered to be meta as a hunter. But it's the problem is, again, that a lot of this, the hunters that are going to be kind of buffed by this uh, aren't actually that, or aren't really that stronger anyway. Yes, there's a reason why um, the current meta is, you know, Polun, for example. Yes, because he has a lot of different abilities and a lot of different ways of uh, dishing out damage and kind of uh, having a good aspect, all of the aspects of like camping, chasing, all of those things. He does have some type of ability to deal with it. But now, yeah, any kind of character that loses uh, that ability to kind of slow the game down, that was something that was important as soon as Mad Eyes came out. Yeah. Yes, I think originally. Sure. Um, are, that are considered to be, well, Mad Eyes is not one of the strongest hunters, and I think he's received enough nerfs already. <laughs> this is going to bury him <laughs> deep down. And photographer. The last time <laughs> Mad Eyes and competitive was probably Koa 4. <laughs> like, there was, yep. it was like a round one, uh, it was like a round one pick. I forget what it was, but it was like a main, it wasn't a mainland China team. It was, I believe it was possibly a Southeast Asia team that did pick. Mad Eyes in round one, and I believe got like a 3k, but that's like the last time I've ever seen anything from Mad Eyes in competitive. Yeah. Especially with all the indirect <laughs> nerfs that he's gotten, so he, mm -hmm. um, kind of like some of the most impactful ones would probably be on Moonlit with walls being instantly uh, removed on, on anything that's placed on bridges, um, inside the two story mm -hmm. as well. Um, Mm -hmm. There have also been instances, particularly in Moonlit and Eversleeping, where entire consoles have been removed. <laughs> and just... Okay, I didn't know that, but I did know they were moved around, but uh, that's not good. Yeah, it's okay. not good at all. There was one that was specifically targeted in Eversleeping, because I believe there was like a competitive match where um, there was a chair, I believe it was outside the middle two story, uh, where that okay. was originally a very trappable chair. So. That entire console was just kind of like removed. It seemed kind of targeted there, but there was also a cipher inside two story that was completely removed. So now mm -hmm. on Moonlit, um, the two story is almost a completely safe cipher. Yes, that is an issue. And on various maps, he just doesn't have vision um, on certain areas. Uh, if I remember correctly, because I have played Mad Eyes in like duo hunters and stuff like that that's obviously different but uh still one of the exegates is unwatchable right if i remember correctly it depends um so for instance on lakeside you can see both gates on uh, on red church you can see both gates but red church is kind of difficult because the way that they're laid out a lot of the consoles are 
one console, one cipher machine. So all a survivor has to do is get rid of like one console and then he's able to freely decode. And that, a lot of his power comes from being able to go at a cipher with multiple consoles. That's why if I was to be like a walls man, I, I might actually like Lakeside because that's one of the few maps left that he has that kind of amount of control being able to touch. Like for instance, middle of cipher can be reached by three consoles. But Red Church, yeah. almost every cipher is one to one, um, and he literally cannot even see middle broken. Like, there's no console there at all. And his abilities for people who don't really play him often are very good at slowing down decoding because you can, um, especially if you're like camping a chair, you can, uh, you know, because like, I don't really play Mad Eyes, but I'm assuming that this is what people do, um, is that they'll usually camp the chair physically, but they will use their walls to stop people from decoding, to maybe harass the incoming rescuer, that slows down the whole match. But now with this addition of decoding getting incredibly fast in the late game, this is less impactful and also kind of pressures him to be constantly on his console, but then that means he's not dealing with survivors where he physically is. Yes? Yeah, uh, uh, I think that just about sums it up. So basically, a lot of times, the camping, it'll, we'll put it for a character that's probably more familiar for most viewers here. It'd be like the equivalent of camping with a spawn follower and harassing with a leech, except Mad Eyes can do that across like the whole map. Um, yeah. Just to like a lesser extent, because obviously walls or chip hits and are reliant on energy and survivors can actually control the consoles themselves. It's very interesting that yeah. Mad Eyes is the only hunter that has an ability that the survivors can literally use against him. <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so in the case of Mad Eyes, this is a problem. In the case of Photographer, who, whose whole, ability, like most of his abilities are based around slowing down decoding, is a big issue because at the end game, in the end game, everyone's going to be able to decode cipher machines. I can't remember what the exact cooldown is like on his, uh, you know, after a mirror world is finished, or even how long a mirror world lasts, uh, the photo world lasts for. But I think it's probably faster to decode a whole cipher machine from zero to, to finish before he even gets to use one of his abilities again after the cooldown is uh, started. But either way, it's not much of a difference. You'll be able to finish the cipher machines, like pop them like popcorn. For in sure. a way, yes? <laughs> um, for people like Percy and Undead, who's uh, again, very dependent on, because he needs on average, uh, 50 to 20 hits just to be able to, you know, possibly win. Um, it's a big issue because, yeah, Cypher Machines are going to be done by the time you get your first or second person down properly. Yes? Yeah. Percy um, relies on a whole lot of downs and being able to just boom, 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 yeah. follow up the survivors. Yeah. You want to teleport right to another Cypher, get all these decoding, um, get all these decoders yeah. off the Cyphers and just kind of laying on the ground. but. The less time you have to do that, just kind of across the board, the more difficult it's going to be for Percy. Yeah. Um, so all of these hunters are going to suffer a lot from this, but I do think the early game is going to feel a little bit more rewarding than it currently is, because a lot of complaints, and I would say I also agree with these complaints, is that it feels like you get your first person down and then the three cipher machines pop. Yeah. I yes. think that's a lot um, more with more survivors being introduced that can eat a third hit. I mean, you have your psychologist. If you stack a steer on top of that and say psychologist is first down, you're going to need like four hits on this survivor. Not to mention if you add a priestess on top of that. Like if you have all these characters yeah. that are able to in some way assist or um, be able to eat other hits for other survivors, it's just a lot of times is kind of an unrealistic scenario for most hunters to be able to get it down before the first round of pops. And it, it also feels like um, Nettie's uh, almost ref refuses now to release a character that doesn't have some type of mini kiting ability. Yes? Um, originally, let's say, you know, mechanic. No, I wouldn't say that she's... She's a strong survivor, but she's easily countered because she has no real ability that helps her to kite. But... Uh, with the addition of like prisoner, even though it's not a good long stun, it's something that helps him kite. I don't Everybody's think there's been any stun. survivor. <laughs> yeah, everyone's got to have a stun or some type of ability that lets them just kind of kite that little bit longer. Yeah. Mm. Um, 
if, yeah, of course, with the new addition of kiting survivors like uh, Patient, where he was able to cover, I'm glad they got, changed his uh, hook because he used to be able to like fly halfway across the map. <laughs> But uh, it feels like every character that's come out recently does have some type of kiting ability that means that they have more survivability, making the early game, whoever you pick, um, much more difficult for hunters to deal with, even if you get the optimal character that you wanted to get um, to find in the early game. Yeah, I think that's pretty, pretty much correct. I mean, you look at the past couple of releases, everybody has gotten something to increase survivability, and that's kind of surrounding the way the survivor meta stands, because uh, currently, I mean, you look at the meta, psychologist, even um, patient, acrobat, I mean, a lot of these characters, you kind of have like a more difficult time finding a survivor that's currently being used in the meta that has a lower survivability with the exception of possibly mechanic, because mechanic has a separate yeah. ability that she's not useless while on the chair. True. But yeah, but she's easy to she's easier to get down. Yes, um, if you find her. But yeah, that, the reason why she's popular is because she has other abilities that help her, even if she is down. Uh, it's an it's an interesting thing, and it's nice to see that we're getting a slower early game because for if you do get someone down earlier, then you'll have more time to go and harass stuff, uh, maybe slow down the decoding and stuff. But you do just have to get lucky. A little bit uh, with getting that early down. That is uh, the same as it's always been, but it's more impactful now. That's a good thing. Just late game is going to be a bit of a pain. And I do think the reason why the Netties is doing this, if you also look at the recent releases of uh, Survivors, is I think they're definitely trying to promote teamwork a lot more. Um, and this means that if your early game is better, meaning that if you have good harassers, if you have good uh, assists, as you said, like Priestess, who can make good portals. If you play more cohesively as a team in the early game, you can easily pop the Cypher Machines in the later game when your decoding is much faster. Yes, and I do think that's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to promote more people playing together, with the, also with the release of better uh, chat systems, with better notifications of like, what well, this person has this amount of items left. Yes? Yeah, for sure. I, I think this is definitely going to put a lot extra emphasis on kind of that early game stage, with, especially with that first kite. I mean, you got characters like Forward, Priestess, Seer, a lot of assist characters that are kind of in this meta. In addition to that new chat system, it might make um, solo ranking and uh, survivor rank possibly a little more tolerable, being able to communicate with your survivor team mm -hmm. a bit more. And they are definitely trying to promote this as being the way to play the game uh, because now you can afford to not decode instantly, uh, not go to a cipher machine. You can afford to be a little girl and to go onto someone's shoulder. You can afford to be a priestess putting portals for your teammate or for you know to be a weeping clown that's a recent addition, not a very good survivor, but uh, to be able to use his rocket to extend a kite or a seer to be able to um, get that extra blocking of a hit, yes? You can afford to do that because in the early game, it's not super important that you decode because you can just wait until the late game. And if your team survives long enough, well, you know, you can pop Cypher Machines much easier. Much easier. And I do think that's a good idea. I do think it would be nice to make the change up how the game is played. Um, but I'm not sure if Hunters are being changed drastic drastically enough to keep up with this uh, new, I new idea. Yeah. Yes? I think possibly some of the hunters that would be able to keep up with this would probably just be like, I mean, Breaking Wheel, Dream Witch, and then hunters that are able to assure a really uh, quick, fast down, so your Bloody Queen, your Geisha. Yes. Um, hunters that become stronger Queen, in the early game, everything's going to be put on emphasis in the early game. And while the late game is still going to be important, I think some of these adjustments will um, continue the process of leaving older non-meta hunters behind. Yeah, um, that's something that Netis is doing is, uh, with survivors at least, a lot of the older survivors are getting changed, uh, getting adjustments and stuff like that to make them more valuable in rank at least. Maybe not in competitive, but more valuable in, in rank. Some of the older hunters, although for example we did get Gravekeeper, uh, not Gravekeeper, Gamekeeper, that got uh, his adjustment last year, was it I think it was last year, or early the year before, 
but he got a big change. Is he amazing? No, but you know, in the right hands, he's uh, very strong. Uh, but he did get like a buff and a change, and he now has map pressure, kind of, with his uh, his traps. <laughs> Not amazing, but also something. Uh, but pe characters like Ripper haven't really received anything um, since I don't even know when he was last changed. Yeah, but probably before. He I had was a hype buff um, <laughs> last year, and but basically all that changed was so after he gets presence one, he's able to gain invisibility. Um, and I believe the change was that Asuna. Ripper, once he hit his presence one, if he was not in the invisibility, he'd be slightly slower than what he was at presence zero, regardless. Oh, So yeah. all they did was just remove that effect. Yeah. So again, he's a fun and can be quite a strong hunter in rank, uh, but you just don't see him in competitive. And there is a reason behind that. It's just that, you know, he suffers a lot um, if he doesn't get that early down, and especially with um, meta teams and t teams in voice com, he just doesn't have as much that he can do because teammates are more coordinated. Yes. Yeah. So it would be nice to see some reworks of some older hunters, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll wait for that. I'm just waiting for another Percy skin <laughs> one day. I'll... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we... Hunters will also be able to see Cypher progress. Well, do you want to stop there? We can stop there if you want. Okay, yeah, let's do it. So this is one that I'm very excited for, being able to see Cypher progress without Abnormal, because there are many instances where this this actually could be kind of like a little buff for Hunters in the end game, because especially if you're carrying Trump card, if those... Um, you have like a range between 90 and 100% of Cypher progress that all has the same sound effect. Um, so a lot of times you're taking a gamble if you're switching to trump card that the survivor won't be able to just touch the Cypher and pop it. But if you're able to see where that Cypher's at, it can, it can lead to a little bit more informed strategy as to when you use your trump mm -hmm. card, what you use your trump card on. So I believe that this will be a very... It won't be like super impactful from like a gameplay standpoint, but just kind of when you're a hunter, knowledge is power. Knowing what every cipher is at could um, be true. a big difference in determining: Do I have enough time to go like pick up this survivor, or should I stay here? So, just a little bit of strategy um, to that kind of decision. I think it's, I think it's definitely been needed for a while. Yep. Um, yeah, it's always been something that I was confused as to why it was never added in the first place because um, yeah, it just gives you that little bit of information that can affect your decisions. It can affect, you know, like, okay, I will go that direction and I will try and stop the survivor from coming in because I might be able to hit them. They come towards the cipher machine and they think it's prime, but they sit there and it's like, oh, it's 95 and then you just walk up to them and whack them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, where before you just had to guess by the sound, yes? You were like, okay, well, I'm assuming it's 99. So if I do hit the survivor that's coming in, it doesn't matter, they'll just run up and pop it. And so there's no point in me doing that. So I might better go do something else, yes? Mm. Um, so yeah, it will change some of your decisions and it's nice to be able to make informed decisions. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. Should we talk about Magician okay. next? <laughs> yeah, let's go for it. So Magician is now getting a third wand. All my magician, <laughs> all my magician mains, and my probably rejoicing at this. Okay, I have some opinions on this, but let's uh, tell me what you think about this. I believe it's a very interesting choice. Um, you know, a lot of times when you look at kind of the history of the game, perfumer has historically beat out magician in like every way possible from a kite. The only real main thing that magician had over Perfumer is that he wouldn't feed presents because I kind of like to kind of group these two characters in kind of the same category because their abilities do essentially very similar things. But I believe this will make, this will overthrow Perfumer in every possible way because now if you're good with your wands, you're able to possibly even lose the hunter. Um, but the most important thing is that his ability doesn't feed presence, whereas Perfumer's does. So if you look at characters like, say you're kiting a Mad Eyes, who's very important, um, ability comes with overclock at max presence. Um, 
you can do a really good kite in that early game without risking giving them max presence very soon in the game. Um, even Or in the case of a, a meta hunter, for example, Paloon, um, giving him any presence is uh, almost the death to your team. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was going to bring up Breaking Wheel next. Yes, definitely. Oh, sorry. So I think the biggest yeah. thing is that his ability is not going to feed presence. That's just my opinion on it. And having that third mm -hmm. wand will make make it so that there's not a significant risk to playing the character that there was before, where you use like your two wands mm -hmm. and then you're done. Having a third one, I believe, will provide a lot of wiggle room for survivors to um, not play quite so conservatively with their items, especially when you look at okay. a lot of meta characters. I mean, Priestess has regenerating portals. Seer can look at the hunter and gain more owls. A lot of these survivors are given like three or more, possibly more abilities throughout the course of the game. So I think that giving Magician a third wand is fair, but it will be tough for me to see the significant impact because you do have characters like like Anne, for instance, that specifically counters Magician. So it's not like if yeah. Magician's picked, there's just no way to counter it because, for instance, Anne can still see where the Magician is at if he uses a wand with the cat. That's true. So mm -hmm. I think there will be able to be counter picks to this character still. He can still be countered, but I think mm -hmm. it, it'll... The same way that Perfuma would be, uh, has you know, is countered by certain abilities too. Mm -hmm. Yes, by Anne as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's kind of a back and forth. You can, you can have mind games with that. I agree. I, I think I was expecting... Because, you know, there were rumors of Magician getting changes before this happened, right? He would, of getting adjust, uh, adjustments and stuff like that. And I was expecting something a little bit more impactful. Well, m m maybe not impactful. Different. Something kind of very, very different. Um, and just an extra wand, that is a really big change. I'm not sure if most people watching this will realize how much that is. It is almost and sometimes better than having... Uh, like a perfume, yes? Two, it's like two perfumes, but it's useful in more situations because perfumer is great until she gets hit once. Some perfumer mains would argue that they can still use their perfumes after they get hit, but it's not as consistent and you are hoping that you uh, don't mess up your perfumes. But with the wand, you can use it at any time and it is almost a guaranteed missed hit, yes? Um, so giving him this extra one is a big buff because this means he gets to use another dodge of a hit yes or something like that so that is a big change i was expecting something more like, to affect his character abilities like what he can do and something like or something like that or maybe what the one did and i think it's almost i don't want to offend netties too much but i think it's a bit of a lazy um adjustment to him yes uh that i think doesn't take into consideration that a wand makes him instantly much much stronger yes yeah i think a lot of people watching this might not realize just how like big of an adjustment this will be if this goes into the global server mm -hmm. because if this is implemented i believe that this will kind of over overthrow magician will overthrow a per perfumer and like pretty much every tier list created like after that release forward um because first of all, he doesn't have a uh, slow healing time. He does. He has this extra. Um, he has this extra ability to be invisible when he's rescued. That is not insane, mm -hmm. but it also can be difficult to deal with sometimes if you're a hunter and can give you that little extra time you need to kind of get away from the hunter to avoid you having to be hit by Tide Turner. It's much better than just not having anything because perfume pretty much once your perfume is uh, your perfumes have disappeared. Yes. Uh, or once you've taken one hit. So, yeah, I do think he will become mm -hmm. much better. And I think he was already a really, really good pick in rank mode. I don't think he was good for for tournaments, but I think he was very good for rank mode just because he was, especially if you're solo, because you didn't have to worry about other people doing anything because you already had abilities that kind of was like self-survive abilities. Yes? Yeah. I'm wondering if this... It'll be interesting to see if he does move into competitive gameplay because we've we've hey. seen perfumer used in limited instances before, um, but we've even seen characters. I'd like to liken this probably to how female dancers started becoming to be used. And a lot of times, what you'll do is like, for instance, say the mercenary will 
kind of swap out his items in a chest for some other items. And then the female dancer will be able to use the boxes for a while, dash over to the mercenary's chest and pick up some extra elbow pads. And it'll be interesting to see if that type of communication is able to be used to just prolong a magician's kite to a point where the magician's kiting ability is able to really kind of impact the early game to like a significant degree, especially yeah. in instances of very, very good coordination with either that mercenary instance that I just mentioned, uh, obviously uh, priestess seer, even forward stuns can be used. I mean, if we <laughs> see him again, wildling can put that. I mean, you have all these characters that are really good at harassment during a kite. Um, Batter's another mm -hmm. instance. Um, It'll just be interesting to see if he does make his debut on the competitive stage. Yeah, and I think he's become, he was already a very solid survivor with no, you know, when they removed his downside of being rescued 10% slower or whatever it was, yeah, he just became a very good survivor pick. Like, you couldn't kind of go wrong with it because you had ways of rescuing, you had ways of kiting, and having this extra wand gives him more abilities for kiting in the early game that as you as you know we're going to see here as we've already just talked about um it's going to be very important important when these cypher machine changes come because you know the longer you can kite the better it's going to be for everyone <laughs> yes for, yeah. except for the hunter <laughs> i'm starting to think that magician will probably even take up the role of possibly being like an alternative to patient i mean their abilities oh yeah are very different but they kind of act kind of in the same way so um both abilities will be able to like significantly extend your kite. So I believe that we might, I mean, patient is already kind of pretty well up there in the meta. He's mm -hmm. seen fairly often in addition to acrobat. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we see magician up there as kind of a third pick to those two for kind of that kiting role in the team. Uh, and it's also a kiting role that has no decoding debuffs. So it's uh, also makes him more favorable as far as I remember, he doesn't have any debuffs. Uh, makes him more, more favorable in anybody's eyes when they're trying to pick for a team that can have consistent decoding, consistent kiting, and just uh, general abilities that can help in multiple situations. Yeah, he's not much of a an assist character, but and that might be where the meta goes, but he's definitely going to be a character that can just handle anything that comes at him on his own. And uh, I definitely think we'll be seeing him more often in uh, rank modes, and that's exciting, I think. I believe this might actually officially shift in the meta once we start talking about the Acrobat nerf that's coming. Yes. What do you think about this? I don't really, I've never really played Acrobat, and I haven't really uh, played too much against him, actually. Like, I've played against him a little bit, but not something that's a super big pick when I go against him. I mean, Would you like to read out the abilities? Okay. Um, being in Dragon Tier, I face Acrobat fairly often at the moment. Um, yeah. But so it says Acrobat Mud Bombs decelerate speed for 100 decrease from 4552 down to 3035. Ice Bomb decelerate vaulting speed for Hunter decrease from 5060 down to 3540. Fire Bomb blocks Hunter ability reduced from 8 seconds, 12 seconds to 5 seconds, 8 seconds. Acrobat Bombs now only exist at, on the ground at the moment for. 10 seconds. Right. Yeah. Oh, they changed from 15 to 10, I think. Yeah, it's going to be, it's original, uh, now 15 and will be changed to 10. As yeah. far as I have on my notes, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> um, I, what I'm not completely sure on, um, when it says 45, 52, is there, is there a difference between how much sl slow you get and what's the kind of the... The effects of one attack versus two. So if Acrobat mud bombs you once versus oh. mud bombs you once and again. Oh, yeah. It'll, it's okay. just a stacked effect, yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't realize there was a uh, yeah, addition the to first that. One anyways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, I guess it's only a small. Well, it, it's a, an impactful change if you. I guess if you have two more bombs on you, but okay, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> so, Acrobat is a big pick. He's he's meta. He's very consistent uh, on some maps. Yes, especially on things like Moonlit, where there's that one jump that everybody does, even if you're a low tier acrobat, you usually just <laughs> jump off of the platform, um, you know, from any of the roller coasters. Um, and okay, good luck to the hunter, you got to catch up now. <laughs> um, yeah. So seeing some of his changes, which ones do you think are the most impactful ones? Which bomb do you think is going to be 
the biggest impact? I'm going to say um, it's nice that the ice bomb is getting reduced, but I believe the big ones are going to be the mud bomb and the fire bomb because the fire ones used a lot, uh, especially in doorways with projectile hunters to not be able to... Yes. Um, to not be able to use your ability there and getting that reduced um, by th three seconds for one stack is pretty significant when you're thinking that it was only eight seconds to start with. Um, yeah. And mud bombs is typically the one that's used a lot and kind of like assists in helping someone get off the chair um, yeah. and kind of move to a better area. So getting that kind of speed boost reduced by 15% is very, very yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is. Um, especially in combination with the Hunter's change where they're getting, you know, we're getting this new Persona web that reduces our slow as well. This is going to make mud bombs way less consistent uh, in general. That's going to be an interesting one. I do think the fire bomb change is probably one of the biggest, especially since we're seeing that most Hunters now, if you want to if you want a strong hunter, you know, if Netties needs, if Release is a strong hunter, you know it's good when they have some type of ability to hit survivors at range. Yes? Mm -hmm. So this is why Acrobat has always been good against these hunters because, yeah, you can just turn off ranged abilities. You can turn off... Uh, often you'll see that he's picked against characters like Paloon because you can just stop his click. Um, it's kind of a nice thing to do, especially when you're rescuing from a chair. Yes? Yes. Um, yeah, you can just stop them from clicking and getting everyone down on the ground. That's often it's often seen in like live uh, feeds and stuff like that. But yeah, it's sad because I did think that the firebomb felt fair um, ish. It's a pain, but it was fair enough. You know, you you played that well. Uh, the mud bomb was always a bit just annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that, especially when. You get like a survivor the rescues another survivor off the chair, and then a random acrobat comes, throws a mud bomb on you, and suddenly you can't get a hit with pallet. Yeah. I think this will definitely change those types of setups to the point where that mm -hmm. might not be such a thing so much, and it, the mud bomb might be used more exclusively for kiting. But yes. it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Maybe he'll turn into more of an exclusive kiter and kind of less of an assist character along with that. Yeah. Yeah, the Ice Bomb one is difficult for me to tell because I, again, I'm not, uh, I haven't really played Acrobat too much, so I'm not sure when the optimal times to use this are, you know, why you really, really would want to use this over one of the other ones. I think it's, you know, useful for slowing the pickup if you want to delay for some reason or you want to slow down, you know, you want to get some distance when you've dropped the pallet, maybe that's kind of useful. But it is a big change to the Ice Bomb. It's going down by, what, 10%? No, 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 more than that. No, it's, it's, uh, 15. it's going down a lot. Yeah, 15%. And in my experience, ice bombs are kind of used in instances, particularly in front of pallets or in front of windows to force yeah. a vault or a pallet break to be significantly slower. Yeah. So it does give you that kind of time to transition away to another area. Um, is It's a big change, but at the same time, it's if you're using it in that, yeah, 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 I don't know. It's it's an interesting one. It's probably the least uh, significant one out of those three, but it's an interesting one. I like it. It's a fun one. Mm -hmm. I think the acrobat did need to be adjusted in some way, and he has been adjusted since he got his his little kind of forwards roll because he was able to like dash for ages, you know, to get out of your way. So now it's kind of less impactful. That's good. Okay, I do need to kind of finish up sometime soon, but okay. <laughs> We have cold ticket and we have dead hard. Oh, dead hard being the survivors dash forwards. All right, I'll read off the hunter one first, and then we'll get into the spectator adjustment. Okay. It says cold stare. Use a cold star on a survivor. A safety circle is formed around the hunter, and the survivors cannot leave the safety circle during the time. If the survivor leaves the safety circle during the stare, they will be stunned for three seconds. The safety circle will slowly shrink as the time passes. If a hunter uses their ability during this time, this would make the safe circle shrinking temporarily pause. This ability cooldown is 100 seconds and has a starting cooldown of 30 seconds. It's a fun one. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's something that's... It, it'll be very interesting to see that used as like a trait. 
Um, yeah. So I believe what this is kind of meant to do is to counter transitional kiting, I yes. want to gather, and kind of force survivors to be in an area or they'll be stunned by three seconds. Three seconds is basically enough to guarantee, like, guarantee a hit. Kind of no matter where. Yeah, as as long as you're as long as you're a hunter that I think hunters that will benefit from this will be hunters that can uh, back up to kind of force that stun, and then maybe they have some type of movement ability to quickly you know catch up uh, and and wreck them. For example, maybe this is viable on geisha. I think uh, some characters that have that kind of ability to quickly zoom back to a to a survivor because you can force it because i think it's relative to where you are yes uh and um that they kind of the wall cl closes in on them and then they kind of get stunned by it right so if you kind of walk the opposite direction to the to the survivor then they're going to get stunned yes yeah i think it'll be it's an interesting one definitely very interesting now will this be used over traits like blinker teleport or even early game abnormal with geisha it still remains i mean we're gonna have to see how this looks in gameplay before we're going to be able to make too many educated opinions on this but i believe it's definitely an interesting uh change for sure i think it's fun and it's going to be way more useful than listen so that's something yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um yeah the question is is it something that you would want to take if you didn't have trump card i think in most cases from what i can tell it's not going to be something that you just want to take for the whole match um, you do get it very early though. You get it in the first, it takes 100 seconds for the cooldown, but you have it in the first 30 seconds of the match. So um, so that's kind of good because some yeah. of them take longer to get. Uh, so is it useful? It's good against transition teams. And I guess on big maps, this would be more useful. I think on small maps, why are you going to take this? Because there are too many walls. Yes? Yeah. I think uh, this will, it looks, at least to me, it looks like it'll be something that's kind of relatively niche. It could be good yes. in certain specific scenarios, but it'll be tough to see if this is like consistent enough to replace, like for instance, Blink. Yeah, the Blink is a very, very impactful uh, trait to have. So yeah, if you can, re are you going to replace the, the Blink teleport kind <laughs> of combo? Yeah. Difficult, difficult, uh, difficult sell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, there's also an addition to Survivor's Persona Web that is, uh, I like to call it Dead Hard because that's what it's called in uh, Dead by Daylight. But um, it's called, what is it called in the game? Uh, the flying Wheel Effect. Oh yeah. Would so, you like to read that one? All right. It says, this persona gives the survivor a skill. When used, survivor can dash five meters to the angle they are facing being immune to most damages and control effects for 0.5 seconds. Cooldown is 100 seconds and the starting game cooldown is 30 seconds. So yeah. by what I gather, this kind of persona replacement gives the survivor a, a skill that allows them to get like a small speed boost, if I'm not mistaken, and then immunity to damage. So for people who haven't played uh, Dead by Daylight, this is a complete. It's it's a copy of the ability. It's uh, it, and that's that's. I think that's that's good because it means that we can uh, judge it, sort of, because the games are quite similar. Yes, in their how they work, how they work. Um, so how Dead Hard works, and it's exactly how this ability works, is that yes, it's a small dash forwards, and during this dash, you are immune to. As far as I understand, it's everything. So it affects uh, the same in Dead by Daylight. You are unaffected by any type of ranged attacks, normal attacks, abilities, slowdown effects. You can just dash through all of it. And this is going to be very impactful for hunters that really, really rely on one-hit wonder abilities. Yes? And Blink. Blink can... is going to be affected by this. I can imagine instances like, for instance, like a Ripper losing a Foggy Blade to this. I can see this being a potentially frustrating effect in the future. My question yep. with this is, will it be more useful than Borrowed Time, Tide, or the Window Trait? <laughs> uh, broken Windows. I think yes, but only for certain survivors. And I have had a little bit of a think about this. Um, I think the, hunt, the survivors that will benefit most from this are going to be decoders because, um, you know, 
except for mechanic, where mechanic usually takes tide turner, right? But um, if you're a, a decoder that doesn't have anything, for example, Mind's Eye, um, this is going to be a better pick than Broken Windows because you're going to have a because you have a slow vault. So mm -hmm. why are you going to take Broken Windows when you're going to you you know maybe you get over the window, <laughs> maybe you I don't. A result in a terror shock. <laughs> yeah. So it's nice to be able to have this ability to avoid any type of damage. Also, characters that I one of the ones that kind of stood out to me first was characters like Doctor. Um, I know she's not played in tournaments, but she's an annoying survivor to go against, and her ability to be able to avoid blinks now will be very impactful when she's sitting behind a uh, dropped cipher, uh, dropped pallet, and healing up. She can just expect you to uh, to blink, and she just dashes, and she misses that hit, and she can continue kiting or whatever. Um, or just in general, just avoid any type of attacks that she needs to, to get to a pallet, drop it, and then um, heal up. Yes? Anyone that depends on that tiny bit of time that they need uh, are really going to be effective, you know, are going to take this. I don't think it's going to replace Tide Turner for people who take Tide Turner, and it's Broken Windows is... A nice pick, but I'm not sure if there's any survivor that absolutely needs broken windows. I'm not sure. Maybe there are. And I certainly don't think it's ever going to replace borrow time. I have seen some discussion oh, no. <laughs> platforms that they're saying, why would you carry <laughs> borrow time when this exists? And it's like, no, it's like, it's the most broken persona in the game. Like, you're not going to replace that with this ability. It seems yeah. like no matter how good it is, it doesn't seem like anything's going to be able to no. trump that ability to pop a cipher and be and get basically another life. Yeah, borrowed time is just how the meta and how everything, how the game works. Yes, everything revolves around borrowed time, and because of that, yeah, there's nothing, nothing's going to change until they nerf bor um, borrowed time. But I don't think they will. Um, this is just going to be a nice consistency buff, and. Once you've seen it in Dead by Daylight, you do understand how useful it can be. It does sound very minimal, but it is incredibly impactful. And this is one of the reasons why uh, in Dead by Daylight, this is something that almost every survivor takes. Yes? Uh, mm. It just gives you that little uh, oomph that you need, that little kind of space you need to kind of close before to get to a pallet, that uh, ability to uh, dodge a violinist note. Um, yeah, because you're immune. Um, that little time to counter bonbons, explosives. Yes, maybe you're just in the range, but you want to get out of it. Now you're out of it, um, and there's nothing that the hunter could do because you're immune during that time. Uh, Geisha, who is very, very dependent on hits, and she's now becoming very competitive. You know, she has a very inconsistent hitbox, um, and she really does depend on that one chance that she gets to hit you. You can now dodge that. Um, you know, it's all these hunters that really, really rely on getting one hit to change up the whole kite are going to suffer from this. And I think it's, I think it's a good trait. It's going to be fun to play with and against, but it's there are going to be some uh, serious side effects. I think. <laughs> as a Mad Eyes main, uh, as a Chase Mad Eyes main, I'm crying on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, Mad Eyes is going to be affected by this. Uh, also because oh look, there's a wall. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's fun, um, but it's it's very strong. But it's not something that everyone's going to take. It's only going to be survivors that don't take Tide Turner that will probably choose this. Maybe uh, because again, De uh, Dead by Daylight and IDV are a little bit different. But uh, I do think people will probably choose this over Broken Windows if they have no real good reason to take or, uh, Broken Windows. Yes. This is just way more useful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's fun though. I'm looking forward to seeing it, even though I do feel like it's going to be such a pain to deal with. <laughs> but yeah. Okay. Is that everything we've got? I think that is just about everything. Awesome. We've had a good chat. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Let's do this again sometime. Maybe when of the course. next set of changes come out, we'll be able to do another one of these sort of podcast esque type situations. I, I always joke around that they're going to delete uh, Hunters eventually. So when they delete Hunters, you <laughs> know, we can... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, no, definitely. We should definitely do this again. I would like to have you on some streams. And if you do, you know, you do streams as well. I would love to participate yeah, sure. in those. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Yeah. All right, let's be in. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that very, very thorough analysis. Uh, if you like this video, please be sure to leave it a like and subscribe to this channel for more content like this. I'd also like to encourage you all to head over to Phoenix's channel and subscribe to his uh, content as well. He's doing some very, very good content on his uh, channel, and I encourage you all to check it out. And I'm interested in hearing from you all in the comment section below. Uh, what are your thoughts on the changes coming to the test server? Do you like them? Uh, do you agree with our analysis, disagree on some topics? I'd love to hear from you all in the comment section. And I will see you all next time. Bye-bye, everybody.